job, man. Appreciate that. That was wonderful, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, take your Bibles and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 14. The Gospel of John, chapter 14. And if you don't have a Bible, I encourage you. We have some Bibles there in the pew you're welcome to use. It's always good to turn in the Word of God and see as well as hear. We'll remember things much, much better. And as you're getting there, I just want to review a little bit as far as uh, the children of Israel. It's going to have something to do with what I'll be preaching about here this morning. The children of Israel, as they uh, were there in Egypt and God was ready to bring them out uh, of their bondage, they saw God perform many miracles. Uh, there was a lot of miracles that God performed, and those miracles were done uh, on the land of Egypt, but they were not in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were. And God had separated them many times. And God was doing this to teach Pharaoh a lesson, and also so Pharaoh would eventually let the people go. And then you have the last miracle, the miracle there of the death of the firstborn, which was known as the Passover, and that applied to the whole entire land. And everyone who did not obey what God said to do, they lost their firstborn. Their firstborn child would die, uh, or their firstborn animal would die, and it didn't matter if it happened from the least servant all the way up to Pharaoh's house. Now, eventually, uh, Pharaoh did let the children of Israel go. They wander out into the wilderness. They were able to spoil the Egyptians. Uh, the Egyptians gave them all kinds of jewelry and everything that they needed. And as you heard, Brother Harper preach a great message. And the only thing they didn't have uh, was weapons. But they came to the Red Sea. <clears throat> and while they're at the Red Sea, of course, there's a mountain on both sides of them. They see the Egyptian army uh, coming up behind them. And they're now afraid for their lives. Moses, the only individual on that side who said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. He didn't know what God was going to do, but he knew God was going to deliver them. The rest of the children of Israel just whined and complained until they crossed the Red Sea as God had parted the waters of the Red Sea where there was a wall of water on both sides. They crossed over on dry ground. When they got to the other side, the children of Israel then sang the praises to God just like Moses did. But just a couple of days after that, they start whining and complaining again that they're hungry. They're going to starve to death. Why did Moses bring them out here into this wilderness to starve? And then God provided manna for them, uh, a miracle in and of itself. He provided bread from heaven and fed them for the next 40 years every single day with that wonderful manna. But that wasn't good enough. The children of Israel complained again. Thought they were going to starve. They said, why are we eating this loathsome bread day in, day out? So God said, okay, you want some meat to eat? I'm going to give you some meat. And he uh, gave them quails to eat. So many quails uh, they ate. The Bible says it was coming out of their nostrils. They had so many quails they were eating. Uh, it was, I mean, just the land was covered with them. And you thought that would be enough. Well, they whined and complained some more that they're going to die of thirst and uh, God provides a miracle. He has water coming out of the rock. He also, at another time, uh, he takes them to a place where they were whining there at Mara, uh, where the water was bitter. They were only a very short distance from a land where there were 70 palm trees and many springs of water. And God was providing all this time. And I tell you all that to say this, is because so often in my Bible reading, when I first started reading the Bible, the first several times I went through the Bible, I would always marvel at the children of Israel. And I thought, Lord, how can a people be so incredibly dumb? They see these great miracles. They see your mighty hand at work. And yet time and time again, they doubt you. Time and time again, they, they just disobey what it is you're telling them to do. This pattern continued even when they went into the land of promise. They still continue to doubt God. Now, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that all of those things in the Old Testament were written for our learning, and they were there for our examples. 
So now we come to the Gospel of John, chapter uh, 14. And we come to a passage of Scripture where the Lord is trying to teach His disciples a very important lesson. And the reason He's wanting to teach them this lesson is because this lesson is to be carried down to you and I today. And He starts off here, we're going to start in verse 15. And He says this, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. And I'd like to draw your attention back to verse 15, where he says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. The question that I would have for you here this morning is what was wrong with the children of Israel? Why did they have such a hard time? What is wrong with the average Christian? Or even the average church? Well, what is wrong with the children of Israel is the same thing that's wrong many times with the average Christian, and it comes down to disobedience. Mm -hmm. And our disobedience is there because of our lack of love for the Lord. If we had loved God the way He wants us to love Him, we would obey what He says. Jesus says it very plainly in verse 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. What is the secret to the Christian life? What is the secret to being faithful to God and just trusting Him and having our faith uh, grow where we trust God for greater things and, and more things in our life. What is the secret? The secret simply is loving Him so that we obey Him. That's the secret. Now turn back, if you would, to Deuteronomy. Hold your place here because we'll be right back here in just a second. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, the fifth book of the Old Testament. And look at verse 4, if you would. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Now, the book of Deuteronomy is given to the children of Israel right before they're ready to go into the promised land. They've been wandering down the wilderness for almost 40 years, and this is the last bit of instruction that God is giving to them, and He's wanting them to remember these things that's in this book. These are some very important things. In chapter 5, we, that's where we get the Ten Commandments. He's rehearsing many of these things over and over to them. But look at chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart, and thou shalt teach them, and notice that next word, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. You know, we're always teaching our children and our grandchildren things. We're teaching the young people in the church here things. And we're teaching them, a lot of times, things that they shouldn't be learning. And the way we're teaching them is by the way we live. It says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. He didn't leave anything out there. That's a continual uh, a continual time frame. He says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and, upon, and they shall be as frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. God is telling the children of Israel here, here's, a, here's what you need to do with what I'm telling you. And God says you need to do this diligently. And you know why God said that? Because God knows us. He knows we're very prone to forget. He says you need to do this continually. Time and time again. Every single day. You need to be faithful with this. Because we are all prone to forget. And when we forget what God says, we can't obey what He says. And when we don't obey what He says, we're not loving Him like He deserves to be loved. The secret to the Christian life is to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Let's pray, 
and we'll get into the message. Our Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. I pray that you will guide and direct our thoughts here together today. And I pray also, Lord, if there be any in our service that is not sure if heaven is their home. Lord, I know that you love us. But Lord, they may not know that. They may not understand that. You love us so much that you did the very best thing for us you could. You sent your son to this earth to die on the cross for our sins. And you paid the price in full so we could have a home in heaven. And Lord, they must receive that free gift for their salvation. But Lord, for those of us who have put our faith and trust in you, Lord, the thing we have to stop and consider here this morning is how much do we love you? Do we love you as you deserve to be loved? Do we love you as you command us to love? And Father, I pray that you help us now because I believe if we do these things, we will be blessed beyond measure. Our cup will be so full that, Lord, we won't be able to handle the, the amount that's there and it will be overflowing. God, I just pray that you help us here this morning. May you be with us. May you guide and direct my thoughts and my words. And may the Holy Spirit of God speak to hearts today. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Why are so many Christians not enjoying their faith like God, I think, intends for them? They're not enjoying, but they're enduring their faith. You know, we look at the news and we get discouraged with all the things that go on. And, and it's, I don't think you have to look very far to see America's in a mess right now. America's in a world of hurt. But you know, this was mentioned last night at the God and Country Rally, and it's true. Our hope is not in a politician. If your hope's in a politician, you're in sad shape. It doesn't matter what party you belong to. It doesn't matter what uh, candidate you're going to vote for. Our hope is not in a political candidate. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. And if our hope is not in Jesus Christ, that's why we're in the mess we're in. You see, we can see all the mess around us, but even in the mess, here's the wonderful thing. God wants our joy to be full. He wants us to be blessed beyond measure. He wants us to experience a piece of heaven here on earth, not just wait until we get to heaven. He wants us to have all the blessings that He has for us right here and right now. But many people aren't enjoying their faith, and it's simply because of the lack of obedience. We sing the song, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Now we sing the song, and the song rolls off our lips very easily, but I believe with all my heart the two most difficult things to do in the Christian life are trust and obey. They're difficult to do. But we're going to learn here hopefully this morning how it can get a lot easier. Martin Luther said, we are not saved by faith and works. And he was right. You can't be saved. You can't go to heaven based on your own efforts and your own energy and your own merits. We aren't saved by faith and works, but we are saved by a faith that works. The faith that God saves us by will work and do something. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's work. That's obedience. James chapter 2, verse 26 says, faith without works is dead. It's of no value. You can say you love God all you want. The devil loves God. Not really. He believes there's a God, though. And what does he do? The Bible says there he trembles. So what is the secret to the Christian life? Well, love is the motive for our obedience. That's really the secret, is love. And once we understand this, and understand what Jesus is telling us here, Jesus is telling the disciples, because he wants the disciples to teach their followers they're going to have, and then their followers to teach their followers, all the way down to us today, to where now we are teaching one another this very principle about if we love him, keep his commands. Look, if you would, also in verse 21, what Jesus says here. He says, he that hath my commandments, and guess what we have right here with the word of God? We have his commandments. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now what he doesn't say right there, and he's saying just the opposite, he's like if you have his commandments and you don't keep them, then you also don't love him. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Skip down if you would in verse 23. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. You see, Jesus is saying here over and over again, love is the motive behind why we obey. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 30, you don't have to turn there because I'm going to read the verse to you and then refer to it. When we think about loving God, here Jesus refers back to Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Mark 12 and verse 30, he tells the disciples, let me back up to verse 29. It says, and Jesus answered him, he says, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It sounds exactly like Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. And now he's going to start saying, verse 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Now what's interesting, when he says this is the first commandment, he then goes on and tells us what the second great commandment is. And what is the second great commandment? Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But do you realize you can't do the second commandment until you've done the first commandment. If you're not doing the first commandment well, you're going to have a really hard time with the second commandment. Matter of fact, over in the, the epistle of 1 John, he tells us very plainly there in chapter 4, he that saith he loves God and hates his brother is a liar. That's pretty strong. If you have a problem with a fellow believer... And yet you say, oh, how I love Jesus. God says, God says you're a liar. You know why? Because you're not doing the second commandment. The reason you're not doing the second commandment is because you're really not doing the first commandment. You see, all of this comes down to love. How is our love of God today? So let's look at these four things that Mark 12, 30 says. Loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. So if we're going to love God with all of our heart, what does that mean? Well, our heart is the very center of our being. It's the very center of our life. Without your heart beating, guess what happens to you? You're dead. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. Our heart must continue to beat because it's what gives us life. Now, none of us here this morning, I, I hope you haven't been doing this, sitting there thinking, you know, heart beat, heart beat, heart beat, heart. You don't have to do that, do you? It's the miracle of life. God says when he breathed into man's nostrils, he became a living soul. He did a lot of things. That's called an involuntary uh, reflex. It's what our heart does. It just pumps. It just beats and it pumps that blood through us. It's a miracle of God. But the heart is the very center of our being. And it's what we are to love God with. In Mark chapter 7, verse 6, it says this. This people honored me with their lips, but their heart... It's far from me. Years ago, I told uh, my first youth group I had uh, when I became a youth pastor, some of the things I saw them doing troubled me. Some of them would go out soul winning. You know, they would talk a good talk at church. But I would observe them in the Christian school. I would observe them sometimes in the community. And I, I finally just told them, I came across the scriptures here and I said, look, I can tell, I don't even have to follow you guys around. I can tell what music you're listening to. I can tell what movies you're watching. And, of course, at that time, the Internet just kind of started taking off. I said, I can tell uh, what you're surfing and looking at on the Internet. I can tell all that stuff, and I'm not even that smart of a guy. The Bible says, by their fruits, you shall know. You see, what we, as a man, thinketh in his what? Heart, so is he. I said, I can tell these things just by observing your life. And you can tell the same thing about me. You can tell if I'm reading my Bible or not. You can tell if I'm fellowshipping with the Lord or not. Because our works do matter. It shows whether or not we're obeying the Lord. And we can sing all we want, oh, how I love Jesus. But if our heart is far from God... Our life isn't going to match what our lips are saying. You see, we have to love God with all of our heart. We sing on Sunday morning sometimes the song, 
And the words to the song goes like this, I will be true till thee, till death. We sing it Sunday morning, and we're nowhere to be found Sunday night. Isn't that true? Are you really going to be true to him till death? Oh, well, Brother Walt, you don't know uh, what's going on. You don't know what's going on in my life. I don't really have to know what's going on in your life. God knows. And he doesn't accept your flimsy excuses either. He doesn't accept mine. But yet we offer him all the time, don't we? You see, we need to love God with all of our heart. This morning, the last song we sang there as a congregation was the old rugged cross. It says, His shame and reproach we will gladly bear. Is it really a shame and reproach that we're gladly bearing? I know there's some in here who, uh, I know sometimes the evening services, this is why we're looking to change our evening service times, because people have kids and they've got bedtimes, they've got things to do. But God says to teach your children diligently to do what? To love God. Now, what are you teaching your children when you're teaching them it's more important to get an extra half hour, an hour of sleep than it is to obey God? Right. Something to think about. We're always teaching our kids something. You're teaching them it's more important to get rest. The Bible says love, not sleep. But what are you teaching them? You see, I'm just saying, I'm not trying to get only anybody here. I'm just saying, we need to love God. That's the problem with the average Christian is our love for God is not as it needs to be. And if it was as it needs to be, and we're keeping God's words, we are going to be blessed abundantly. And that's what God wants for us. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. But we need to be obedient. And if we're going to be obedient, it's got to start with our love. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. There's a lot of people that's going to stand before God one day. The Bible says every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. They were religious people. They were in every church service, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, every revival service. But they died a lost person because they never accepted the free gift of salvation. They never asked the Lord Jesus Christ to save them and forgive them. They tried to be a good person to get to heaven. They tried to get to heaven through the baptistry. They tried to get to heaven through the church attendance. They tried to get to heaven through the offering plate, putting in their 50 after 50 or whatever they were doing. They tried to get to heaven that way. The, Jesus said, many are going to say to me in that day. Lord, Lord, have we not done all these wonderful things in your name? Have we not cast out devils in your name? And he's going to say those very sad words. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. For I never knew you. He's, he's going to say that one day to some of these Pharisees that he's preaching to. Some of these Sadducees. Very religious, devout religious people. And it's not because he wants to say it. It's because he never knew them. They didn't love God as they thought they loved God. You see, we need to love God with all of our heart. But we need to love God with all of our soul. This, the soul is the rest of our being. It's everything else. There's no area left out. There was a, uh, this was going on years ago, back when D.L. Moody lived. D.L. Moody was a great preacher. Uh, a lot of people wanted to hear D.L. Moody. Uh, many people got saved. They would have him in for revival services. And there was a group of preachers in the community. They said, hey, we need to get D.L. Moody in here. And they kept saying, hey, we need to try to get D.L. Moody. We try to get D.L. Moody. And there was one guy who just got so sick and tired of hearing it. He said, what? Does D.L. Moody have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And one guy who was very wise quickly spoke back. He said, no. But the Holy Spirit has a monopoly on D.L. Moody. Does God have all of you? All of your heart? All of your soul? And then it goes on there in Mark 12, 30. says we're to love God with all of our mind. The Bible tells us that with the wicked, God is not in all of his thoughts. Now, I love football. And I love watching West Virginia win yesterday for a change. <laughs> Didn't like last week. But I enjoy sports. I enjoy a lot of things. 
I enjoy working in the garden. I enjoy sometimes just being outside. I enjoy going and visiting people. I enjoy a lot of stuff in life. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things. But you know what? If I'm thinking about football from Saturday to Saturday, and that's all my brain's consumed with, or I'm thinking about doing uh, work around the church or other things that are not related to my relationship with God, and that's all I'm consumed with, there's a problem. Because I'm wicked, and God is not in all my thoughts. You see, God needs to be in my thoughts. That doesn't mean 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. But we need to consider God with everything that we do in life. Everything we do in life. Whatever we get. The clothes we wear. There was one time I was going golfing. I was up in Parkersburg. I was going golfing by myself. and uh, I like to get out there early, get a cart. And there's one course up there you can golf for like $33. It's all day long. And I love it. And, of course, the carts only last about two rounds of golf. And I can get out there and play a round of golf in about 45 minutes. I mean, I'm out there just hitting the ball, and I'm going to see a <laughs> next, get out there, hit another one. And I'm just trying to get in as near rounds as possible. And uh, before I got out to the course, the thought came across my mind, and I know it was from the Holy Spirit of God, saying, you got to take a couple gospel tracks with you. <laughs> oh, I don't need to take a couple gospel tracks. Who am I going to see on a golf course? I'm out here golfing. And I didn't listen. You see how we don't obey? That quick. God was not in all my thoughts. Did God have a problem with me golfing that day? No, he didn't have a problem with me golfing. I went out there. After about my second round, I was on my third round, had to change carts. I came across and ran across another guy out there golfing. And we decided we were going to play that round together. And we got to talking and stuff. And I asked him what he did. He asked me what I did. Told him I was a preacher, this and that. And right in there, the Holy Spirit of God smote my heart. He said, I told you so. And I kept thinking, man, I wish I had a gospel track. As we were in separate carts, so it's hard to talk to him for any length of time at one time. But when we were on the tee box or we were on the green, you know, I kept trying to bring the conversation around, and I could never get it to where I had a clear opening to give him the gospel. And I kept thinking, man, I built a relationship with this guy. He, he's listening to some things I'm saying. I wish I had a gospel track to give If you love me, keep my commandments. You see how quickly it can happen? How easily? We need to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind. The Bible talks about our meditation. We ought to be students of the Word of God. But it goes on and says we ought to love God with all of our strength. This means all of our emotional strength. Now, there's some churches that try to work up emotion. You'll get preachers that get up preaching, and they start talking like this. <laughs> and they start spitting and howling and doing all this crazy stuff. If you don't talk like that normally, don't preach like that. <laughs> I mean, get over it. Why do you preach like Because you saw somebody else do it. It doesn't work. We had a guy preach like that when we were down at the temple. Great guy. I love the guy. And he got up. And I was so looking forward to hearing this message. And he started doing that. And I thought, what is he doing? I couldn't even focus on the message. I'm sitting there thinking, this poor guy. Somebody has trained this guy completely wrong. God saved you. And he wants to use you for who you are. Don't be somebody else. Be who God made you. We're to love Him with all our emotional strength. This doesn't mean that I'm to get up here and run across the tops of pews. Now, if the Holy Spirit of God led me to do that, praise the Lord. I may never, there may, there's been a probably a time or two I would want to jump over this table. But it better be in the Spirit of God. It better not be for entertainment purposes. You see, we can get worked up in our emotion. That's not worship. It's okay to love God with our emotions. God gave us the emotions we have. We're to love Him with those. But we're to love Him with our physical being. We're to love Him with our financial being. God wants us to love Him with everything we have. Our spirit, our finances, our physical well-being, everything. He wants it all. And He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now, how do we love God? 
The word of God is the standard for our obedience. It's the measure for our obedience. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says in verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he doesn't love me. Verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Verse 24, he that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. God is going to use his word to help show us what we need to do to obey. Now, do you know what it means? Do you know what the opposite of obedience is? It's disobedience. We call that rebellion. Have you ever seen a rebellious child? Aren't they fun to be around? Well, they're a blessing. Do you know how you can fix a rebellious child? Start applying some things to the seat of learning. That's how you fix it. Use the Board of Education. <laughs> It's like a little river when he was at our house. They gave him a train spanking. He told Bali when he got home, he said, I got an education spanking. <laughs> That's what he got. <laughs> but you know, God, the Bible talks about rebellion. In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22 and 23, uh, Saul was being addressed by Samuel, King Saul. And Samuel, God gave him some things to do. And he obeyed most of it, but he didn't obey all of it. And God simply through Samuel told him, says, look, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, if you practice witchcraft, you were to be stoned to death. Yeah. That's how seriously God takes rebellion or disobedience. He says rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. Now, as a West Virginian, we all know being in the Appalachian region, we have some Virginians here as well. But being in this part of the country, we're kind of a stubborn, bullheaded people, aren't we? Now, that can be a good thing if we're stubborn about the right things. This is the Word of God. I'm not moving from it. What we have right here, I'm going to be pretty stubborn when it comes to that. You're not going to convince me, sway me, anything else. I will die for what's in this book. Now, when we start getting stubborn and stiff-necked about the wrong things, when God tells us something and then we dig our heels in and say, "Mm, I'm not going to do that, that's rebellion. Oh, well, it's not that bad, preacher. Isn't it? You ought to take a gospel track with you when you go golf. Mm-hmm. Dug my heels in. Who am I going to see? Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. You see, God's word will tell us what we need to do. And if you have a child that's rebellious, that child is not going to have an intimate relationship with their parent. Now, their parent... If they're a bad parent and they're uh, a blind parent, they, they might think, oh, my child loves me and just cares. And, what? and that child has got them wrapped around their little finger. That child has trained that parent instead of the other way around. That's what's happened. And God wants us to make sure that that rebellious child is no longer rebellious because God wants that child to have an intimate relationship with the parent. Just like we being God's child, God wants to have an intimate relationship with us. Some people read the Bible and say, you know what? I just don't understand what I'm reading. Some people will pray and they just don't get their prayers answered. They say, I don't know why God's not answering my prayers. Do you know why? Probably, not always, but probably the reason is you're not obeying the things God already told you to do. So why does he want to hear from you in the first place? You're a rebellious child. You see how serious that is? God wants to hear and answer our prayers. You have not because you ask not. But if you look back, look back here in verse 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But look back at verse 14. He says, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And then he jumps right off into this obedience thing. You see how they're just tied together? Our prayers getting answered is important to God. But he wants us to obey. Us understanding the scriptures is important to God. Some people are blind when it comes to the scriptures. They think they understand. But they are so far out there in left field, they're nowhere close to what God's trying to say. You know why? Because they're not obedient. And why aren't they obedient? Because they don't love God the way they think they love God. Look, if you would, here verse 21 again. 
It says, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he that is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. And notice this last part. And will manifest myself to him. Do you know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit, one of the Holy Spirit's job in a Christian's life is to guide and lead us into all truth. God says, I want to manifest myself to you. I want you to understand this book. I want you to understand so much more. And I want you to see so much more clearly than you ever thought possible. But you've got to obey some things. And God's not going to reveal a whole lot of other things to you if you're not obeying what he's already showed you. You see, that's how it works. The Christian life is a series of just being obedient. And once you're obedient to those things, God will start revealing some other things to you. You continue doing this, and guess what? You'll grow in Christ. You know what the first thing God tells us to obey? To obey His will? Is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And thou shalt be saved. Every single one of us in here is a sinner. Because we're all a sinner. We all deserve the same thing. We all deserve hell in the lake of fire. But I'm glad there's a God out there who created this universe, spoke it into existence. He does not want that for you and for me. But that's what he's going to have to do if we do not accept the free gift that he's offered. You see, that free gift must be received. Or it's not yours. It's not mine. I received that free gift when I was six years old. The Bible says we're all sinners. It says the wages of sin is death. It tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, the blood of Jesus Christ was shed to pay for our sins. And if we will put our faith and trust in Him, when He rose from the dead the third day, that proved He was able to save us and forgive us our sins. We don't have to try to save ourselves. It's all what He did for us. It's that simple. A child can understand that. When we put our faith and trust in Him and ask Him to save us, He promises He'll do just that. That's where the Christian life starts. Once it goes from there, now it's a matter of obedience. Now, does God expect us to obey in our own strength? If you can't be saved in your own strength, guess what? You can't obey in your own strength either. That's the crazy thing. We don't have to obey in our own strength. Look what it says in verse 15 again. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Notice how it's tied into prayer, the verse before that. But look what's tied into it, the verse after it. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. He's talking about the Spirit of Truth. He's talking about the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. He says, look, you don't have to obey and do all this on your own. I'm going to give you another Comforter. I'm going to give you some help, a guide here, if you will. In John chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus said this to the disciples. He said, it is expedient for you that I go away. It's necessary that I go away. Because if I go not away, the Comforter is not going to come. But if I go away, I will send him unto you. Well, what a blessing that is to have the Holy Spirit of God. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes and lives within you, and now he will help you to live the Christian life. Remember as I was getting ready to go out golfing? Who was it do you think told me, you better take a gospel track with you? It was the Spirit of God. Now, he didn't say, whoa, take a gospel track with you. That's not what he said. It was the still small voice in my heart. He says, you know what? You got to take a gospel track with you. I don't need to do that. I don't really, you better take it off. Okay. Matter of fact, I went out to golfing again another time, and the Holy Spirit of God told me this again. Guess what I did the second time? At that time, I actually listened. That's unusual. Usually, I do the same thing wrong twice. And, but that time, I actually listened. And guess what? Another situation came up, and I was so thankful that I was actually able to talk to this person. And I, I mean, we only talked for a brief amount of time, and I was able to leave a gospel track with them. Praise the Lord. But be obedient to what God tells you. And I'm glad we have the Holy Spirit of God living within us. The answer to living the Christian life is not an intellectual answer. You'll find YouTube videos all over the place, people trying to give some intellectual answer. You can backslide with a Bible under your arm. It's not an intellectual answer. It's not an emotional answer. It's not trying to work things up in a service. It's not trying to work it up in song, singing the same phrase of a song a thousand times and everybody's swaying. It's none of those things. It's not an emotional answer. It's not activity. There are some people who get so busy serving God. They're out soul winning. They're, they're teaching a Sunday school class. They're going, those are great things. But at the same time, I know preachers that's in this situation. 
Serving God, serving God, serving God. Yet their families are dying and going to hell. Yeah. Now that priorities drive right away. You heard me tell you this when I first became pastor here. As your pastor, you're not my first priority. My children aren't even my first priority. My wife is my first priority next to my relationship with Jesus Christ. My relationship to him first, he must always have the preeminence. My relationship to her second, my relationship to my children third, then my relationship to my church. That's the order. Now some people don't like that. Well, you better start reading your Bible. Because that's exactly what God teaches. And when those things get out of whack, our life gets out of whack. Same thing with your life. You see, we need the Holy Spirit's help. It's not just busyness that's going to get us there. The answer to living the Christian life is found in the power of the Holy Spirit of God. By simply taking what God has given us, His words, His saying, and then showing our love for Jesus Christ by keeping what's in that book. God loves us. He wants to protect us from danger. All we need to do for the Holy Spirit to have complete control in our life, for us to love Him with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, all we have to do is just yield total control to Him. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, To whom you yield yourself, servants to obey, and His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You see, it's our choice. Who are we going to yield to? Whenever we have a guest speaker in, I always like to do something special for him. So Brother Harper, he likes to go golfing, so we went out golfing. And we went up to Pipes Den, and uh, Nehemiah was able to go, Pastor Dan was able to go. And we got a chance to you know, fellowship a little bit out there. But while we were out there uh, golfing a little bit, Nehemiah, of course, we were riding in a cart together. It's about the 14th hole. Now, Nehemiah just turned 8 years old. He doesn't have his driver's license yet. <laughs> but everybody wants to drive a golf cart. I mean, that's just the way it is. And everybody enjoys driving a golf cart. The funnest thing is when it's the dew's nice and wet, you're going down the hill and you hit those brakes, you whip that thing around, start going down. You don't do that on a nice golf course, okay? <laughs> you do that on a bad golf course. We didn't do it there. But anyway, me and my, I don't know, probably the 13th, 14th hole. He said, Daddy, will you let me steer? And I've been driving this whole time. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't have a problem with steering. He's like, you know what, I'm going to do one better. I said, I want you to slide on over here in the seat. And I went around and got in the passenger seat. And I said, why don't you just drive us? Now, we were in a big open fairway. Nothing he's going to hit or anything like that. He's like, oh, I don't want to do that. I just want to steer. I said, no, you'll be okay. You can drive. He said, I don't know what to do. I said, well, see that thing right there? I said, that's the gas. You hit that. We'll take off. I said, the other one's the brake. He hit that gas. There we go. And I said, no, no, hit the brake. Now, hit the brake. So I had to teach him a little bit what to do. And then he was wanting to use both feet. and said, no, you just need to use one. That way you have control. And he was going pretty good there for a little bit. And then we got to this real steep hill. It wasn't real long, but it was pretty steep. And, of course, he's a little guy. He can barely see over the front. He goes, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to. I said, just trust me. He said, you'll be okay. I said, just put your, hit the gas, get going, then hit your foot on the brake, and just kind of glide down the hill. And he did in the sign. No big deal. He drove for like the next two or three holes, enjoyed himself. And I stopped and thought right there. I said, you know, that's exactly the way we ought to be with the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm going to be us. He's going to be the Holy Spirit. I've been driving all this time. Just like I've been in control of my whole life. The Holy Spirit of God says, hey, why don't you let me take over? Okay, well, you can steer a little bit. That way we still have control of the pedals. Isn't that what we do? Yeah, God, you can take me wherever you want to go. Uh-uh, I don't want to go there. And we grab the steering wheel. Isn't that what we do? Let's be honest now. It is. We're still in the driver's seat. But you know what God wants? God wants us out of the seat. And say, hey, why don't you get there? God, you just take over. You run the pedals. You take the steering wheel. I just want to ride along. That's what God wants from us. We just need to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. We live the Christian life. We obey Him in the power of the Holy Spirit. But we need to know what God says from His Word. And when He tells us something, obey it. And then God will reveal more of His Word to us. 
And the reason we do all that is because the secret to living the Christian life is how much do we love Him. When Jesus Christ was beaten, they tied Him to a pole, they whipped Him with the cat of nine tails, nine leather straps going across His back. Many times people think there were pieces of metal and, and rock and stuff tied to the other end of those straps. As the leather straps cut open His back, those pieces would come around and catch Him in the front. Many people died from that beating. Because they would get a jerk in their intent. I'm not trying to be disgusting, but their intestines would fall out onto the ground. That's the way he was beaten. He was he's beaten even more than that. When they buffeted his face, they would play a game many times. I've read where soldiers, they used to play a game in those days. They would put a bag over your head. And if there were 14 soldiers there, 13 of them would come by and boom, they would hit you real hard. One of them wouldn't do it and you had to guess which one didn't or they did it all again. The Bible says his visage, his face was so marred more than any man. You couldn't even tell he was a human being. He was a piece of meat. But when Jesus Christ, when they crucified him, the Bible says every bone in his body came out of joint. They set that cross down in the ground. He wasn't tied to that, that tree, to that old rugged cross. He wasn't tied there. He was hung there by three nails. And many times people suffocated because they have to... The pain was to be so excruciating on their wrists, they would have to put all the weight on their ankles. And then it would close off their chest cavity where they were so weak. And then they would have to lift themselves up with those nails pierced in their hands to relieve the pressure of their ankles. This went back and forth and back and forth. But His blood was shed there on Calvary to pay for our sins. Do you think Jesus Christ said, Father, just a little bit of blood, just a little bit of beating, no. Jesus Christ, when he was in the garden, he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He knew what was coming. But then he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That was love. Some preachers have said, how much does God love you? He loved you that much. Yeah, right. Do we love Him? Mm. Do we love Him with all of our heart? All of our soul? All of our mind? All of our strength? The devil loves to use some of the pettiest things in our life to get us out of fellowship with God. Sometimes they seem like, at the time, they seem like such a good excuse. But that's all it is, an excuse. I'm glad we have a Savior that loves us. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I sure would like to help you with that. Let's all stand. We're going to have a word of prayer with our heads bowed and eyes closed. We're going to have a song of invitation. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, nobody looking around, let me just simply ask you a few questions here. If you were to take your last breath and your heart was to quit beating, and you were to leave this earth, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? You say, preacher, I know for sure I would go to heaven because I've done what the Bible says I need to do. And I know that. If that's your testimony, would you indicate that by lifting your hand up and put it right back down? Thank you. I can't you see every hand. God does, though. That's the main thing. And if you couldn't raise your hand, I appreciate your honesty. I was in a church service just like this and I couldn't raise my hand a couple times either. But I'm glad there was somebody there who loved me who told me the truth. And I'm here to tell you God loves you this morning. He's loved you your whole life. You maybe didn't realize it because you didn't understand what He was doing in your life. But the Bible tells us that we are all sinners. We all deserve God's wrath. We deserve to split hell wide open. That's what every one of us deserves. God knew there was no way we could save ourselves, so He sent a Son to this earth to die on the cross in our place. He became our substitute. His blood can wash away all of our sins. And the Bible says that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and we believe in our heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, it says, Thou shalt be saved. Wouldn't you like to know for sure heaven's your home? How many say, Preacher, I didn't raise my hand a moment ago, but I sure would like to know how I can go to heaven. I care enough about my eternal soul. I would like to get that settled here this morning. If that's you, you're not ashamed of it, would you indicate that?
that by lifting your hand up so I can see it. I wouldn't call you out or embarrass you in any way. I would like to help you. Anybody like that? Lift your hand up real high so I can see it. Looking around. Well, I know that God loves you. If you couldn't raise your hand, God does love you. And what you need to do is you need to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to save you and forgive you of your sins. So you can have a hope of heaven. But the thing is, don't think that you can just get saved whenever you want to. If the Holy Spirit of God is not dealing with you, you can't be saved. You have to deal with the Holy Spirit while He's dealing with you. Now, Christian, let me ask you this question. How many say, Preacher, the Lord spoke to my heart. And I am guilty of not loving Him with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, all of my strength. I've been found guilty, but God knows my heart. I want to be that person. I want God to use me in a mighty way. If that's the desire of your heart, would you indicate that by lifting your hand up real high? I see many hands. Praise the Lord for that. You can come down. God wants to help you. The Holy Spirit of God is there to help you. But you have to let Him have control. Let Him have the driver's seat. 